Leighton Andrews, professor at the Cardiff Business School. Welcome to the Business School. Um, we like to portray ourselves here at Cardiff Business School as a public value business school, which means we're focused not only on the um, economic issues uh, around business, but also uh, business's wider role in respect of social and environmental issues uh, as well. Uh, and it's been very much part of our mission over recent years, it's been part of the way we conduct ourselves in the business school, it's integrated into our teaching and into our research uh, as well. Uh, I'm delighted this morning that we have uh, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Mark Drakeford, with us. I'll say a few words about Mark, Mark in a moment. But as you'll be aware, this is one of a regular series of uh, seminars that we have here uh, in uh, the Business School, organised by our Executive Education team, and welcome to our Executive Education suite. The next event will be on the 13th of November uh, with uh, ONS, Office for National Statistics, talking about management practices uh, and productivity uh, at that event. We're always delighted to have uh, a number of business organisations in involved in sponsoring uh, the activities uh, of uh, the executive education uh, team uh, and can I just ask this morning Adrian James from Bruton Knowles who are our sponsors today just to say a few words. Thank you Leighton, good morning everyone. It's nice to see so many faces here. Um, Bruton Knowles are really uh, proud to have been long-standing partners of, of the University Business School in presenting these events. Uh, it's the first one I've been to because I haven't been with the company that long. Uh, those who don't know us we're um, a national and regional firm of property advisors, been established over 150 years, big office in Cardiff, and one of our main things in Cardiff is strategic land. And so when we had the chance to look at a topic for today, what else could we pick? Uh, and I'm very pleased that the university managed to uh, get the minister to come and speak to you all. So uh, I won't delay you any further. Thank you all for coming, and uh, hopefully we'll learn something this morning. <coughs> Thanks, Adrian. Um, well, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, former colleague, uh, Mark Drakeford, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary of Finance, um, to talk on the subject of vacant land tax, an interest that, uh, uh, that I know that we've shared from previous conversations uh, when I was uh, in, in the Assembly and in government myself. Mark um, is currently the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, formerly Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Local Government. Been the Assembly Member for Cardiff West since 2011, but of course has had 20 years involvement in uh, devolution, having formerly headed uh, uh, Rodri Morgan's political team, a special advisor uh, in, the, uh, in the Welsh Government uh, when Rodri was First Minister. Mark also has a long-standing connection, of course, with this university as a former Professor of Social Policy here. Uh, and retains uh, a, a, a role in that sense, an honorary professor. Um, and of course, he's led on and continues to lead on Brexit issues for the Welsh Government. And I'm sure he may, uh, should there be any questions on that front, he may have some observations uh, to make during the course uh, of, uh, of, of the session. Um, he has introduced the first range of Welsh taxes since fiscal devolution. Um, he is currently a candidate to be a candidate for the leadership of uh, Welsh Labour. Uh, some people believe that he is the favourite uh, to be uh, the next Welsh Labour leader. He wouldn't uh, at all thank me if I were to say that I agreed with that point of view, uh, so I won't. Um, but can I ask you please kindly to welcome Mark Drakeford. Well, uh, Leighton Dichyfawr am y gyfluniad uh, garedig. Uh, na, a Dichyfawr i chi uh, gyd am ddod uh, bore ma. Thank you all very much indeed for the opportunity to be here uh, this morning. Looking forward to uh, a discussion as much as just a presentation <coughs> on uh, the issue of a land, uh, vacant land tax for Wales. Uh, but to do that in the broader context of fiscal devolution here, uh, in Wales, the way we aim to go uh, about it, and where this particular strand fits into that wider picture of the story so far, and where that story may lead uh, over the next few years. Um, in what I'm sure is an over-schematic way, uh, I tend to think of 
different terms of the assembly as being characterized by particular sorts of uh, policy preoccupations and events. So we are 10 years uh, this year uh, as the anniversary of the Jerry Holtham report uh, into the Barnett formula, the way that money uh, operates across the United Kingdom, and fiscal devolution really does have uh, its roots in that really important work that Jerry did back then in the 2007 uh, National Assembly term. Uh, it was the Hotham Review that gave rise to the Silk Commission, uh, which happened in the 2011 Assembly term. And it was the Silk Commission that, in some ways, put the flesh on the bones of some of Jerry's ideas <coughs> in terms of the extent to which fiscal responsibility should be devolved uh, to us uh, in Wales. And that work, that work of the 2011 uh, Assembly, uh, was not just the work of the Silk Commission. It led to the 2014 Wales Act, and it led my predecessor, Jane Hutt, to do a lot of the heavy lifting of fiscal devolution in putting in place the machinery that would be needed in the current assembly term to actually discharge some of these new responsibilities. So it was while Jane was the finance minister, for example, that the Welsh Revenue Authority, the legislation that led to the Revenue Authority, was taken through uh, the assembly. And I will go from here uh, this morning to the Welsh Revenue Authority uh, to mark the fact that it is exactly one year uh, to this month since the first meeting of the Revenue Authority Board. And there's a board meeting uh, today, and I'm going to attend it to mark what I think has been a remarkably successful start to the complex business of creating a new national institution for Wales, and then uh, getting off the ground in April of this year, uh, collecting taxes, making uh, administrative decisions in a way that has not attracted a single headline. Uh, and I remember saying to the chair at the start, if you want a measure of success in the job we're asking you to do, it's that you never appear in the newspapers. Uh, and other than some properly uh, celebratory <coughs> pieces about the work of the WRA, it's managed to do that uh, very well. So this is the first ever uh, assembly term, in fact, as we very often say, the first time for 800 years that taxation decisions that apply in Wales have actually been made in Wales. And we got off to a very modest start, uh, this time last year, when I laid the draft budget in front of the Assembly in October 2017, I set for the first time uh, rates and bans for Wales in land transaction tax, the uh, successor tax to stamp duty land tax here uh, in Wales. We were able to make it the most progressive form of property taxation anywhere in the United Kingdom. We lifted very large numbers of households in Wales at the bottom end of the income stream out of that property tax altogether. And in order uh, to pay for that, we have increased uh, the rate modestly on those at the top end uh, of the property uh, system. Uh, we also uh, set rates and bans for landfill disposal tax, a small tax, a tax designed to be uh, to put itself out of business because the idea is, is that by taxing uh, waste going to landfill you persuade people not to do that and so the tax diminishes uh, over time. But nevertheless a very important policy tool, not a revenue raising tool but a <coughs> behavioural tool and I'll say a bit about that in relation to a vacant land tax uh, in a moment. And earlier this month uh, <coughs> I set Welsh rates of income tax for the first time ever, and they will come into force in April of next year. Now, consistent with the messages that we've had from uh, businesses and from others who have an interest in this field, I have taken 
what I think is a relatively precautionary approach to these things. I regard next year, as far as income tax is concerned, as a year in which we bed the system in, and we try to make sure that the significant changes in the administrative machinery that are required to set Welsh rates of income tax work effectively. Some of you will know uh, that when this happened in Scotland, and we're a year or two behind Scotland in a lot of this, there were a number of people in Tunbridge Wells who received letters from HMRC telling them that they were going to be paying Scottish rates of income tax. I often thought I would have liked to have been in, in the room uh, when those letters were, were, were opened. Uh, and there were people in Scotland who didn't get a letter at all. Uh, now, HMRC tell us that they've learned lessons from all that experience and that the uh, introduction of Welsh rates of income tax will be smoother than that. But because you never know at the very beginning of any new change, uh, I have taken the decision not to change rates of income tax here in Wales next year. So if people in Ceredigion never hear about Welsh rates of income tax, but people in Chester uh, do, uh, then it won't matter in a practical sense because they'll both be paying uh, the same uh, amounts. Thereafter, once the system is bedded in and we are sure that it is working effectively, there will be other decisions for uh, other finance ministers to take, I think in the next assembly. Because as I say, if you think of this in assembly terms, then my view is, is that this term has been about establishing fiscal <coughs> devolution, making those early decisions, getting the machinery set up for more significant changes in the future. And as a result of the decisions that the National Assembly will make in this budget round, <coughs> over £5 billion of the money that is spent on public services in Wales will be raised directly as a result of decisions made in Wales. And that is a real sea change uh, in devolution. Uh, we were for a long time what people in Scotland used to taunt the uh, original Scottish uh, Parliament as being a pocket money Parliament. You know, uh, an institution in which it was given money by somebody else and could then spend it but had no responsibility for how that money was raised. That is certainly not uh, true uh, here in Wales from April of next year uh, onwards. I wanted to just to say for a moment that as well as having the new responsibilities, we have tried to go about discharging them in a different uh, way. So uh, exactly this time, uh, yes, let me uh, clock, I was <coughs> sitting down uh, in the Treasury uh, in London for my meeting with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury in which we rehearse particular Welsh uh, needs and perspectives ahead of the UK Government's uh, budget on the 29th uh, of October. If you talk to a Treasury Minister about uh, the budget, you are talking to somebody steeped in the uh, Trappist Buddhist uh, tradition. Um, it is difficult to get the Chief Secretary to confirm whether it's half past eight in the morning, uh, let alone uh, to tell you anything uh, about what the UK government is planning in their budget, because they are steeped in that Treasury uh, tradition, uh, that tradition that says that secrecy and closed systems and the ability on budget day to pull rabbits out of a hat is somehow some greatly prized skill uh, on a Chancellor's uh, behalf. We really have tried to go about things differently here uh, in Wales. I do not think that that uh, tradition is one that serves us uh, well. It certainly does not serve us well as a devolved United Kingdom where crucial decisions that will be made in that budget have direct impacts and different impacts on Scotland, on Wales and indeed in Northern Ireland, but where our ability to have an influence on that system is so very uh, constrained. Here we have published tax principles and we have published an annual tax work programme. Those of you who are interested in all of this can find all of that uh, publicly available. I hope we are settling into a pattern uh, now. This will soon be the third time we have published a tax uh, work programme. I hope we will publish that again 
in January or February and then I report on the tax work programme alongside the draft budget that is laid at the start of October and you will see that on the day that I laid the draft budget this year there was a report on the tax work programme during uh, this calendar uh, year and I want to do it in that way because I think we make tax policy better if we are clear about what we are trying uh, to achieve, if we are open in telling people what that program is and the progress that we are making on it, and where we can engage uh, people who have a direct interest in this field in helping us to discharge that uh, work. And in that way, we establish an annual tax cycle here uh, in Wales, in which people who are directly affected by the decisions have a clear and explicit sense of the timetable against which uh, we make decisions, the parameters within which we uh, are working, the point at which we will report uh, on it, and crucially, therefore understand better the opportunities that they have to work with us to do uh, things better here uh, in Wales. Now, today we're going to uh, be focusing on one particular strand in that wider uh, fiscal uh, position. Uh, and it is what was at the time a rather obscure part of the Wales Act 2014 uh, because tucked away in it is the ability for us to uh, proceed with Wales-only taxes. Now, it was both obscure and, if I'm truthful, uh, I think um, a rather unhelpfully uh, described power because it's a power for us to ask Westminster uh, to hand the power down to us to then develop a Welsh only uh, idea. So you can see there are lots of uh, steps in this uh, journey many of them not directly in our own hands. But in the way that I think of particular tasks as falling to particular periods in the Assembly's development, it seemed to me when I became Finance Minister that it was an important part of this, assembly's, this Assembly term's responsibilities to test that machinery, to establish it uh, in this Assembly term because once we've got the machinery up and working and have proved how it can be put to work, then I think there will be bigger possibilities uh, for the future. And in many ways, the vacant land tax is the guinea pig in all of that. It's the very first idea. We are sending down this track and we are making the track in front of the idea. So, you know, every time we take the idea one step further, we're having to dig the road uh, in front of it to try to see how that idea can be uh, brought about. Now, some of you will know that we started with a conversation uh, with people in Wales about all of this. Did people feel there was an appetite for developing Wales-only taxes? And if they did, what sort of ideas uh, would they find uh, attractive? And I had a rare, I, probably unique in my experience at least, uh, moment. I'm standing on my feet in the Assembly in July uh, of last year and I'm making a statement on this idea that we would test this uh, machinery and to create uh, new ways of taking money uh, out of the pockets of people uh, in Wales. Uh, and as I am talking, my screen, because you know we, we've all got computers in front of us uh, in the Assembly, I can see on my screen that as I am on my feet, there are emails coming in from people in Wales uh, saying, giving me ideas. Uh, as to how we could develop new taxes uh, in Wales. Uh, it always takes me a bit by surprise that there are people watching what we do <laughs> 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 in the Assembly. <laughs> but the fact that not only were people watching what I was saying, but that they were on their computer sending <coughs> in ideas to me while I was still on my feet uh, making the statement really did uh, take me aback. And we had an astonishingly rich period over that summer and into the autumn uh, of last year, when over 60 ideas uh, were sent in by citizens uh, in Wales. Lots of interest in schools, 
uh, with groups of uh, school students, you know, discussing this in classes, writing letters on behalf of themselves uh, and others. And that led me to publish a shortlist of four uh, ideas, um, a social care levy based on uh, further work by Jerry Holtham in that uh, area, a plastics tax, astonishingly uh, powerfully supported, particularly by young people. And if you, were, if you were doing this simply on a sort of opinion poll voting basis, undoubtedly the one that had the strongest support uh, from members of uh, the public. A tourism tax at a local uh, area, providing local authorities with a permissive power to create a tourism tax in their own areas and a vacant uh, land tax. Now, in February of this year, uh, I said that I had decided that a vacant land tax was the best one <coughs> to test the machinery. And I just want to keep uh, emphasising that, that there were two things that I was trying to balance. <coughs> one, the importance of the idea and wanting to take forward an idea that had a genuine policy relevance to us in Wales, but also an idea that would allow me to try this new machinery out for the first time. And some of those other ideas fell by the wayside, not because they are not ideas that I am keen to pursue, but, for example, I came to believe that a social care levy was too big an idea, too important an idea, an idea that would need uh, more development. And if I tried to test this new way of doing things with that, it might just crash the machinery because the idea itself is so big. On a plastics tax, the fact that the Chancellor in his budget in October, uh, in November last year, announced that there would be a call for evidence for the UK Treasury. I was afraid that the UK government would say, oh, we can't take this forward because we're doing work on it ourselves and we will be stalled in developing the machinery. And a vacant land tax, uh, I came to believe, was the best combination of an idea that was important and proportionate uh, to uh, the task because it is a clear and specific uh, tax. It's focused on a particular policy uh, dilemma, that of how we can promote the supply of land for housing and uh, regeneration. And it is a tax focused on changing behaviours rather than simply raising uh, revenue. And it is at the heart of uh, a policy conundrum that is important here in Wales but across the United Kingdom. Uh, when I was with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury yesterday, we had a very useful discussion about the vacant land tax, both uh, in agreeing where we had got in developing the machinery between us, but also exploring how it might fit in with a wider UK set of actions, which the Treasury is, I think, genuinely keen uh, to lead uh, as to how we can make sure that land is available and then used for key uh, public policy purposes in the housing field and how it can do more to support regeneration uh, objectives. So let me be clear uh, again uh, at this point that the objective of a vacant land tax is absolutely not to make life more difficult for the majority of responsible businesses and land owners who do the important work of developing land for commercial or residential use. The aim is to bring about change in the behaviour of a minority of uh, people who tie up land that could be used to the benefit of people and of uh, communities. And I don't think there is any doubt uh, that this is a genuine problem. I, I do hear from people who say, oh, they don't, you know, where's the problem? What are you trying to solve here? If you look at the evidence uh, from other parts of the United Kingdom, if you look at uh, what the Chancellor said in his budget last year about the gap in London alone between planning permissions granted and developments actually taking place, uh, if you look at the work that he has then uh, set in hand, and we will see further uh, coming through uh, the uh, review that the Chancellor uh, has set uh, in hand, if you look at the work of our own stalled sites fund here 
in Wales, there is an issue, and it is a serious issue, of land where the public has done all the work that falls to the public in providing all the necessary planning permissions and other consents that mean that that piece of land is ready for development, and yet the land stands there with nothing going on. And that's what the vacant land tax is designed to tackle. It is not aimed at pieces of land where those permissions do not exist. It is not aimed at pieces of land where there are other barriers in the path of developers who are working hard to eliminate those barriers. It is designed to address those instances where everything that is needed to bring that land into productive <coughs> use has been secured and where the public purse has played its part in making sure that those permissions are extant and yet the land is not productively being used. And that is in nobody's interests here in Wales and it certainly does not give the public a return which I believe they are entitled to have as a result of the effort that has been made on their behalf. Why does that happen? Well, there is land banking. There are organisations who sit on pieces of land simply in order to prevent others from being able to use it. And there is land speculation. Uh, there are people who would rather sit on the land and hope that the rising value of it, as a result of the permissions that the public has provided, will allow them to sell that land and make a profit as a result of that speculation. And those are the behaviours that we are hoping that a vacant land tax will help us to address here uh, in Wales. Now we have um, examples elsewhere uh, to draw on, uh, and we are particularly uh, lucky to have close cooperation from uh, the Republic of Ireland, uh, both at ministerial level and at very senior uh, official level uh, as well. So I have met uh, in the Republic with people whose job it has been uh, to design their vacant uh, sites levy and to talk to them about the way that they are tackling uh, this issue there. It's not a pick up and drop model. Uh, we know that you can't do uh, things in that way, but you can learn lessons. You can learn some very important lessons that we then can use to tailor any, any vacant land tax to our circumstances here uh, in Wales. So the Republic's vacant sites levy is there to encourage urban uh, renewal and the redevelopment of sites, particularly in their context, uh, left empty following the 2007-8 financial uh, crisis. As in our case, their focus is not on raising revenue but on incentivising development of residential land and regeneration uh, more broadly. For those of you who uh, don't follow these things uh, as uh, closely as uh, I have to, um, I let me say to you that the Republic has a four-stage uh, process. Uh, it has a two-year window before any vacant sites levy uh, is charged. The first uh, stage is that local authorities <coughs> identify and then register uh, vacant sites. And one of the things that I think they have been taken by surprise uh, at is that this levy turns out to be an enormous popular success. So the way that local authorities are being able to populate their register is that citizens contact them and say there's a piece of land vacant at the end of our village or at the end of our street and nothing is happening to it and in fact they don't say nothing is happening to it what they say is is that because nothing is happening uh, to it that land becomes an eyesore it becomes a target for uh, dumping of rubbish it drags down uh, the rest of the locality and so on and it is citizens who are helping local authorities to do the job of identifying and registering uh, these sites. If after 12 months n that land is still sitting there idle, local authorities notify landowners that their sites have been included on the register. So at that point, 
uh, landowners have uh, have a choice. They can take action or they can just allow uh, their land to sit on the register. It's only after another 12 months. So you get a further 12 months after that again to take uh, some action that the local authority levies a charge. And in the first year of a charge, it's to be 3%. Nothing happens now. We've got three years of this piece of land with all the permissions it needs to do something worthwhile, sitting there doing nothing worthwhile. Uh, then, the, for the first time, you get a 3% uh, tax on it, and that's a tax of the site's market value, and that rises to 7% uh, in the second year. Now, it's early days uh, in the Republic, but I think that is a proportionate uh, system. It gives people plenty of time. Uh, to take action to avoid uh, the tax, and that's what the tax is designed to do. They don't want to collect 7%, they want the land to be used and for the uh, levy to be an extra incentive uh, to do that. They've built into it uh, a number of wide-ranging and legitimate reasons for a landowner's lack of development, land contamination, the lack of a resale market, uh, and so on, and they built into it uh, clear avenues for appeal at each stage of the process. So just as we intend, uh, they are clear that the levy is not intended to be a punitive measure, it is not intended to try and single out uh, people for opprobrium, it is intended to add to the repertoire <coughs> of things that collectively we are able to do to drive out better results uh, for uh, the whole of the public and as I said here in the United Kingdom we will learn the lessons of the Letwin uh, review that the Chancellor has set uh, in hand to make sure that we design our vacant <coughs> land tax in that wider UK uh, context and locally again I want to be completely uh, clear with people that we will take this forward, if we can, very much through engagement with those who have uh, a stake uh, in these businesses and can help us to design the measure in a way that delivers the benefits we are confident that can be delivered while eliminating any unintended consequences. Where are we with all of this uh, then? Well, uh, as I said, the first stage in this process is that we have to draw down the power from the UK government uh, in order to allow us to bring forward proposals of this sort. Uh, I was very anxious that we avoided uh, the difficulties of the old ELCO process that they <coughs> will remember all too uh, well, which was the earliest days of the Assembly acquiring lawmaking uh, powers. I have tried to be as clear as I can with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury that it is not her business to take an interest in the policy matters. It's not for the UK government to decide to give us the power if they like what we're going to do with it. Uh, their job is to test whether uh, this is a power that is genuinely devolved in the devolved area, that we are not going to use it in a way that would affect UK-wide tax receipts, uh, and that uh, there are not unintended consequences at a UK level. And I am actually pleased to say uh, that those discussions with the UK government have been quite productive, uh, that I jointly signed with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury a protocol for this earlier this year in which the Treasury will look at the things that are genuinely relevant to the Treasury, and so long as we can satisfy them on those tests, then the power will come uh, to Wales. We're in the sort of final straight of that first part of the process. Uh, I hope that by the start of next year, we will have passed all the tests which it is fair for the Treasury uh, to lay down. I'm confident we can do that. And then it would be for the Chief Secretary to lay orders in Council at both Houses of Parliament, and then the power will come to Wales. And when the power comes to Wales, it is not my intention to introduce the day after a vacant uh, land tax to the floor uh, of the Assembly. Uh, my intention will be, when we've got the power, then to do some further detailed policy development work, and as I say, to do that uh, very much in a way that will involve those who have an interest 
in it here uh, in Wales. To do it, for example, through the tax advisory group that we set uh, up, to do it with a tax practitioners forum that we work closely uh, with, you know, that includes all the representatives of the organisation you'd expect, the CBI, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Institute of Directors, the local Welsh Local Government Association, uh, and so on. But to go beyond that in the specifics of a vacant land uh, tax to make sure that our thinking is located firmly in the wider context of land and property taxation in Wales and in housing policy more uh, widely. Uh, let me end uh, then by just widening uh, back the focus again in that way. I started by trying to paint something of the broad context in which a vacant land uh, tax comes to be part of public debate uh, here in Wales. I've tried to say something to you both about the process through which this tax might come about and the considerations that will lie uh, behind it. But just to broaden the focus out for the last uh, few moments of what I have to say, to be clear that we will go about uh, designing and if we are in a position to delivering a vacant land tax in Wales in a way consistent with the principles I set out earlier. We will try and do it in a way where we are as explicit as possible uh, with people who have an interest about what we are trying uh, to achieve. We will try to do it in a way that brings people around the table together here in Wales to share expertise to make sure that, uh, as I say, if there are uh, ideas we have not thought of or consequences of which we want, we need to be aware that those are explicitly uh, put to us. And only then will we start the parliamentary process where a bill uh, is put in front of the National Assembly and scrutinised in the way that, that would be. Uh, if, I, if I am very lucky uh, and if all the things fall uh, in our way, uh, we will be able to do this within the rest of this uh, assembly term. Uh, and then I think we will together have succeeded in doing something quite important here in Wales. Uh, we will have succeeded in taking a relatively obscure uh, power, that uh, we will have designed a system which we have tested with the UK government and shown that it can be made to work that we will have demonstrated that we have ideas that we can use to turn those powers <coughs> into something uh, real, and that we will have worked together uh, to design and deliver something that is of genuine public policy relevance and worthwhileness uh, here in Wales. Uh, about. thank you all very much indeed. <laughs> Okay, um, I think very thorough, very thought-provoking uh, contribution from Mark. Um, just a, a couple of quick observations. I th it seems to me that Mark's given us not only the, um, the, the, the thinking around the policy, but also the uh, background to the process of how this has uh, been developed uh, within Welsh Government and between Welsh Government uh, and the UK Government. I'm very pleased you're avoiding the perils of alcoholism that uh, we, we used to suffer from in, in making the law in Wales. Uh, but it sounded to me like also a very interesting kind of public value case study potentially for the future. When you think about what is being done here is uh, the public has invested in the creation of value through the granting of planning permission and, uh, and other consents. Uh, and then that public value needs to be brought into fruition, if you like, is through the creation of the vacant land uh, tax. So I hope some of uh, that has been directly relevant, let me say, to, to my students who are coming to a seminar on the cabinet this afternoon and my ministerial module. So that's uh, also directly, <laughs> directly useful and relevant uh, to me. Anyway, um, we, w we, w we welcome questions uh, and contributions. Um, we have a roving mic, as you know, this is being live streamed. Uh, so if you could wait until the mic arrives, uh, but feel free to, to ask questions to Mark. Who wants to go first? What? I spy Professor Calvin Jones. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks so much, Mark. Um, I have absolutely no um, argument with the need for a, a, a vacant land tax um, or the way in which you're um, delivering it. But a slightly wider question. Um, us in this business school um, have argued for um, decades now for the need for something like a Welsh Revenue Authority, 
um, you, you know, advance the, the need for it, if you like, um, so you're in a position to, um, to, to move when we had sufficient powers. But what we also argued for um, is, is something like an OBR of special responsibility, or uh, as I have in Scotland now, um, a situation where uh, Strathclyde Business School um, does quite a lot of work with the, with the Scottish Government to work out what the implications are of, I mean, particularly, I guess, income tax in terms of migration, the regional migration and so on. So I was wondering if, if you could um, tell me where we are in terms of how we develop our analytical capability around taxes um, to, to be able to understand what the impact of some of this is on, on the wider Welsh economy. Uh, well, thank you, Kevin. Look, th that, that's a very important uh, question. I can explain to you where we are at the moment on it. So uh, we concluded something called the Fiscal Framework with the UK Government in December of 2017. Uh, it commits uh, the Welsh Government to commissioning independent oversight of our tax forecasting uh, during these early stages and then requires us to move on simply from having uh, an independent look at our own work to having a body that provides its own tax forecasts uh, for the Welsh economy. So the first stage of it, the oversight of our own tax forecasting, has been carried out by Bangor University. Uh, and again, when I laid the draft budget at the start of this month, I laid Bangor's report on uh, the tax forecasts that lie behind uh, the decisions that I was uh, making. So it's their independent <coughs> oversight of it. Um, I think it, by and large, uh, gives a fairly clean bill of health to the assumptions that we are making and has a series of suggestions as to how we can improve the methodology that is used inside the Welsh Government for these purposes. Uh, we have now agreed uh, how we will discharge the next stage. So this is our responsibility to set up um, a way in which not simply our own forecasts are overseen, but independent forecasts are produced, which I then have to take uh, into account, but which are available to our finance committee and everybody else uh, to see uh, whether they think we are making the right uh, decisions. There were a range of options uh, for that. Uh, in the end, what we have decided to do is to establish a separate contract with the OBR itself to carry out specific and separate pieces of work uh, for Wales. Um, it, it, it's not a solution without some downsides, uh, I have to say that, but in the end there is no organisation with greater uh, resource, with greater track record, with greater uh, independence from government than the OBR. Uh, again, we had some useful cooperation from uh, the Treasury and Treasury Ministers in changing some of the rules of the OBR to allow them to carry out independent work for Wales and for Welsh Ministers specifically. Uh, we will fund it. Uh, they will increase their presence here in Wales uh, in order to do it. They will provide two reports uh, annually uh, to Wales one alongside the draft budget uh, and then a further uh, report alongside the final budget in December which will allow them to use the second quarter uh, information that they will have at that point in which they don't have uh, in September. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. I think in the sense we've talked a bit today that a lot of this is about building a new set of capacity in Wales and a new set of governmental arrangements to allow us to take on these new fiscal responsibilities, uh, I think it'll be uh, an important addition to all of that. Question here. Good morning, uh, Robert Chapman. I'm going to just look down at my notes, if I, if I may, which I scribbled as I was listening. Um, <clears throat> I understand the principle of what's being proposed, but I'm just wondering whether there is a danger of shooting yourself uh, in the foot, so to speak, vis-a-vis uh, -vis promotion of the promotion of housing and regeneration. So um, why I suggest that is that contextually in Wales there's a problem when it comes to development. This is a sweeping statement to realise that, but the problem is around development viability. 
you know, if you ignore the major conurbations, one could argue that development viability is challenging. And actually, um, a lot of vacant sites are held uh, um, by local authorities and uh, housing associations. I, I mean, I know this because, you know, in a previous life working in land reclamation in the WDA, uh, I, I know that there are, there are sites that have been reclaimed that are still held by local authorities going back decades which have not been developed. So, um, and, and so on to, on to the positive, I just kind of wonder whether um, there's scope to think differently about how vacant sites can be brought forward, maybe by a delivery body who could remove the barriers to uh, development. Um, and dare I say, if you go back to the earlier 2000s, um, the organization at that time, I better not mention its name, had a suite of grants, property development grant, business premises improvement grants, et cetera, et cetera, that were meant to facilitate development and make things happen. I just offer those as su suggestions which therefore lead to a question. Oh, well, thank you for, uh, for that. To me, I didn't say uh, when I was talking about the vacant land taxes <coughs> that, in my view, it will quite definitely apply to land held by public bodies, uh, including the Welsh Government, uh, which also has land uh, that sometimes does not get brought into productive use as fast as uh, I would like uh, to see it. Uh, if there are genuine impediments uh, in the path of any developer, uh, and that can be that there is no market uh, for the land, uh, that's one of the exceptions in the Republic's uh, scheme. You're not liable uh, for the land. If there are things that are not under your own control that are preventing uh, that land from being made uh, productive. I mean, you know, if, if you want a single test, if you want to boil it down, that's the principle here. If there are things that are not under your control, you will not be held responsible for them and taxed as a result. Uh, if there are, if these things are things that you can get on and do, and you've got everything you need in order to be able to do it, that's when this uh, vacant land tax would come into uh, into being and it would apply equally to local authorities or housing associations or the Welsh Government uh, itself if you were in that uh, position. Um, one of the things I hope that will happen as we have the debate is that there will be other ideas that we will be able to explore, that we will be able to uh, test. I, I guess I don't start uh, probably from a position where I think that an unelected uh, body is the best way uh, to try and discharge some of these responsibilities uh, in Wales. So, you know, a re-creation of Cardiff Bay Development Corporation, there I said it, uh, um, uh, or, uh, or whatever else it would be, uh, would be the right thing uh, to do. Uh, I've seen some very interesting ideas though on, you know, some sort of Welsh land authority that we could use behind the, uh, the sort of specifics to make sure that there was an organisation that had some sort of Wales-wide responsibility in this uh, area. None of these ideas, I think, are off the table in the way that we will have the debate around the vacant land tax. And one of the really good things about having a specific idea that you can have a debate about uh, is that it will bring back onto the table a set of other ideas in the same field that might mean we will come out of it all, not just with a vacant land tax, if that is what we did, but with a wider suite of policy possibilities and uh, Thank you for mentioning that one. And, and if I may say, just by proxy, there, there are land authority equivalent organisations in Scotland and uh, Cornwall. So yeah, no, there are. Uh, land authority in Wales. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's from that that, I yeah. that the idea that you're a revised, yeah. in today's circumstances, uh, authority. And they do that. Uh, thanks. So the vacant land tax will only apply once planning permission is in place. That's how I understand yep. it. Is that? Yeah. Has there been any? Could you thought, just say where you're from? Sorry, uh, Rian Lee's uh, RPS Planning Consultancy. Has there been any thought to um, how the uh, sort of change in um, construction market will impact on this? Because it's all very well saying, "Come on, you've got planning permission, get on with it." But we've got a huge amount of uh, construction workers retiring in the next sort of 
five years. Who knows what Brexit is going to do to um, the construction industry in terms of um, workers over the next five to ten years. Mm -hmm. And there's a real struggle to get construction apprenticeships up and running. So it's all very well putting the tax in, but has there been any thought to what happens if you know you just can't get a, a builder to build what you've got consent for? Yeah. Well, uh, can I can I just go back to the basic principle I outlined a moment ago? Uh, that if the land is not being developed for reasons that lie beyond the control of the developer, uh, then the tax would not apply. Uh, so if someone is doing everything they can to bring that land into productive use, and there simply aren't the hands on deck to allow them uh, to do it, then that, it, that would fall within that principle, wouldn't it? Uh, so we want to try and work with people to think about how we can make that principle operative in that set uh, of circumstances. And certainly the question is, uh, is very relevant in the wider uh, sense. Yes, the Welsh Government does all sorts of things, working with the industry, working with the uh, construction training board and so on, to try and make sure that we do more to try and bring on an indigenous supply of people who have the skills that we will need to carry out these really important uh, jobs uh, in the future here in Wales. But the industry relies today heavily on freedom of movement, uh, of the ability to attract people from other parts of Europe to come here and help us to create the future here uh, in Wales. Uh, and I said uh, in, int in the introduction that I do Brexit by and large for the Welsh uh, Government at the day-to-day -day, uh, level. Uh, I was in London on Thursday of last week on the Joint Ministerial Committee on European uh, negotiations and we did have uh, quite a difficult falling out uh, moment uh, in that meeting in which we discussed the issue of migration. Uh, so this is the first time for a while that the JMC has discussed migration. The Minister from the Home Office with responsibility uh, uh, came to the meeting. And both Scotland uh, and myself on behalf of, of Wales had to make clear in fairly unambiguous terms that the current set of proposals from the UK government on migration will only exacerbate the difficulties that Brexit is already uh, likely to uh, create for the Welsh uh, economy rather than to mitigate uh, those difficulties. So the proposals of the UK government to create a two-tier uh, system in relation to skills that absolutely doesn't uh, work. I think it's morally indefensible uh, myself. Uh, I think people have all sorts of uh, skills, whether it's the skills you need to be providing care in a care home or whether you are you know, a brain surgeon that you are attracting from another part of the European Union. And the sort of skills that uh, were being talked about then in the construction industry would undoubtedly not be covered by the UK government's definition of a higher skilled uh, worker that an arbitrary uh, salary threshold simply does not work uh, for Wales. If you think that £50,000 is your starting point, and if you can't come out £50,000 uh, as a worker, you're not welcome uh, to come to Wales, then that simply, yeah. simply flies in the face of the circumstances we know uh, that we see uh, here. So I think as uh, our discussions on a vacant land tax proceeds, we will have to be very careful that they reflect any changing contexts. And an adverse Brexit, a hardline crash and burn Brexit, uh, will create a different context, not simply for this one fairly niche and specific strand in our thinking, but far, far more widely than that as far as the Welsh economy is concerned. Uh, Minister Bolita, uh, good morning. Roger Bassett, Chair on the Business in the Community. Um, bit of a noise to this, admittedly, but could you give us a flavour of what percentage of land potentially available in Wales is being banked or speculated currently? And secondly, where is it most acute geographically? Uh, well, Roger, th thank you for that. And part of the work that we will need to do as we move into the more detailed uh, phase of policy development is to be able to give you a better answer uh, to that question. Uh, I think the best proxy we have is the vacant uh, land 
the stalled sites uh, work that we are doing as a Welsh uh, government, where we are providing £40 million uh, to assist local authorities and others to bring sites which currently are not being developed into a position either where they can be sold for uh, development or where development itself can uh, take place. And there are some 400 sites, I'm looking for some help from somebody, yeah. There are some 400 sites uh, that are captured within the current parameters of that stored sites uh, fund. And to be honest, that was without having to go out and search for them. Uh, those were just the sites that came in at the first sort of, you know, uh, right around for information around the system. Uh, so I think you can see uh, from that that there is a significant uh, issue here uh, in Wales. If we uh, try and draw conclusions from work uh, <coughs> elsewhere, and you know you, you can't do it exactly, but if you look at some of the stuff that the Chancellor used uh, in his autumn budget last year, you will see some places where under half of planning permissions actually turn into uh, housing development uh, in parts of England. Uh, I don't think that the position is as acute as that uh, here in Wales, but it gives us some broad parameters that allow us to conclude that there is an issue here, uh, that the issue does apply in Wales as uh, elsewhere, and that as we do the detailed work on the policy, so we will drive out some of the specifics in relation to numbers of uh, sites where we think this would apply, and whether or not they are concentrated in some areas and I'm absolutely prepared to listen carefully to some of the things that housing associations for example going back to the last question tell us about the fact that it takes longer to bring land into productive use in some parts of Wales than others and if there is a geographic uh, pattern that emerges as we look at it and if we learn that there are particular reasons why it is harder and longer to bring about development in some places than others, then I'd want a tax that was fine-grained enough to be able to reflect that. Uh, yeah, my name is Lindsay Doyle. Uh, one of the questions that, that I've got is, um, when you raise the tax, will that tax be used, as um, the lady said in front of me, to regenerate skills in the industry, or is, is there a specific use for the tax once you've raised it? Well, in the Republic of Ireland uh, context, and you know, we've made no decision of, of that sort as yet, in the Republic's uh, case, what they, have used the, what they intend to use the uh, money for is to cover the costs of local authorities in setting up the register and discharging their responsibilities. <coughs> that is the first thing uh, that the tax would be uh, used for. And uh, the minister there said to me, um, if we only raise enough money to do that, that will be fine by me, because we're not looking to raise money. We're looking to change behaviour. So if the tax take is very modest, because the problem is going away as a result of having the tax, that's a very good outcome uh, from the whole uh, levy idea in the Republic. So the first call for it will be to uh, cover the costs of having the system, uh, the second call in their context uh, will be to assist local authorities in the Republic with their planning responsibilities. Uh, so they face some of the same challenges that we do uh, here. Uh, the age of austerity has had a differential impact on local authority services. Local authorities absolutely understandably protecting <coughs> statutory services first and the squeeze falling more on some of the uh, less statutory side of what they do and that includes planning. Uh, so what the Republic is trying to do is to create a bit of a benign cycle in which if there is uh, an income stream from the tax, they wanted to improve their planning processes to uh, have a few more people to provide planning permissions more quickly to be able to solve planning dilemmas where they uh, exist and they're able to use the tax to make a difference to the problem that they identified uh, in the first place. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm attracted to that here in Wales because I know the pressures that local authority planning departments are under and I know how that then has a knock-on uh, effect on people who are trying to make development happen here uh, in Wales. Uh, but we haven't come to any conclusions, uh, Lindsay, of uh, you know, exactly how any money will be uh, used and there will be other 
possibilities, including, as you said, uh, using money that was raised to try and invest in the future workforce, if that's a, no, not if, because we know that that is another blockage in the path of uh, swift and effective development. Hi, uh, Sarah Scott, CHC. It kind of goes back to what you mentioned about local fine-grained policy, because I wondered what you thought about having the balance between a national, clear, simple tax <coughs> policy and local discretion in implementing that, because I believe that Republic of Ireland have experienced some problems of inconsistency across the local authorities, and I know that that's some, an issue elsewhere in discharging duties. So I wondered how you thought we might balance that. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you. That, that's a, a very good question and a very big uh, topic. Um, I can tell you where I, where I, personally, I stand in the big debate uh, on it. Uh, whether that solves all the problems you've identified, I doubt. But my own, my own take on it is this, my own preference is this. I think the job of Welsh Government is to set out uh, clear national uh, rules, clear national policies, but that we ought to be more willing to leave implementation to local authorities that are closer to their local circumstances. Uh, that are able to take into account some of the uh, issues that uh, Roger, I think, uh, raised earlier about the way that you know things are different in different places uh, in Wales. Now, the downside of that is, as you said, that it can lead to what appear, at least, to be inconsistent decisions, because the way that one local authority is implementing the rule book looks different to the way that a different local authority is, and you don't want a system in which there is arbitrary. Uh, difference at an implementation end, but you do want a system in which the local circumstances can genuinely be taken into account in making a policy effective. So it's not an easy balance to get right, that's for sure. Um, my belief in principle is, as I said, clear national uh, policies, quite a lot of discretion in the hands of local authorities at the point of implementation. If you can get that right, then I think you, you know, you, you've got a balance that allows you to try and get the best of both those worlds. Last question. John. John Pusey, Shelter Camry. I wonder if I could um, ask a broader question about taxation and the impact on citizens in Wales. I'm thinking particularly of council tax, uh, you know, the most regressive taxation system we've got. And very welcome announcement by the Welsh Government uh, exempting uh, young uh, care leavers, but I know, Minister, you've been concerned about the issue of council tax in, in terms of addressing that uh, uh, reform of that in the longer term. I wonder if you could just give us your thinking on where we are in that, uh, 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 those changes. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. So, um, a vacant land tax does sit, you know, in that sort of slightly niche place in a much broader uh, set of debates that I think we need to have here uh, in Wales. Uh, so, the big questions are amongst them are you know the balance between uh, taxing income and taxing property. Do we got that right, that right here in Wales? Does tax devolution give us an opportunity to revisit that uh, in some way? And as far as the council tax uh, is concerned, I am quite keen to bring to the surface and then, as far as we can, to resolve in one way or another that long-standing debate as to whether or not the council tax is, with all its very many imperfections is the best that we can do in a fallen world and therefore we have to resolve ourselves uh, to stick with it and to make the best of it or is there a better way altogether so i am on record over previous uh, incarnations when i used to work in the university here of being attracted to land value taxation lvt uh, but i am also very keen in wales that we move on from a rehearsal of the theoretical advantages and disadvantages of LVT and to ask the question about what would you actually need in Wales if we were to try to make a reality of that different form of taxation. So there's a piece of work going on inside uh, the Welsh Government involving uh, external uh, experts and so on that by the start of the next Assembly term would allow a different Finance Minister to look at whether LVT is a practical possibility or whether it's one of those 
it's like these little unicorn uh, ideas you know that everybody has heard of and everybody has talked about but nobody's ever managed to see it work anywhere in the United Kingdom examples elsewhere we know uh, particularly in the United States of where it has worked effectively but there are big reports in Scotland in Glasgow in Oxford in London through the GLA and yet they all remain stuck at that sort of you know stage before implementation uh, I would like us to be able to move on from that in Wales either we decide that LBT is a better idea or another idea local income tax whatever it will be that is better than the council tax or we decide that in a practical sense we're stuck with it and while we are stuck with it there are things we can do <coughs> to make it less regressive and uh, to knock some of the worst edges off it here uh, in Wales so we have retained as you know the council tax benefit scheme here in Wales abandoned uh, in England the poorest families in England now on average contributing over 200 pounds a year to council tax uh, in England whereas here in Wales uh, we have a council tax benefit scheme that people in those circumstances don't pay at all towards the council tax we've got a major uh, benefits take-up campaign going on at the moment so that more people who are entitled to that help get it I found you know I continue to put 244 million pounds aside in the budget for next year to allow us to do that here uh, in Wales we're taking care leavers uh, out of council tax uh, altogether I'd like us to look at uh, the bands could we do more you know to extend the bands uh, at the top end and take a few more people at the bottom end uh, out of it so that's where we are in in the Welsh uh, debate trying to get a different sort of discussion about alternatives to council tax which is grounded in the realities of how you could actually or or as it might turn out actually can't <coughs> make those things happen if we can there'll have to be some you know significant decisions about how we move from the council tax to that uh, different system if we can't then we need to focus together on a wider repertoire of ways in which the current system imperfect as it undoubtedly uh, is can be made fairer for people particularly at the bottom end of the income scale thank you very much mark yeah. um, i i think uh, this morning we've enjoyed something of a, a seminar not only in the policy on uh, on uh, vacant land tax but also in the process of governance if you like as to how these decisions have been uh, developed and thought about uh, and negotiated uh, through the system and the ways in which they would uh, subsequently be implemented uh, in due, due course. Uh, can I thank you all for, for attending and remind you that the next seminar is the 13th of November with the Office of National Statistics on management practices and productivity but can I also then ask you to thank uh, Mark for his contribution here this morning. <laughs>